You've probably already read this somewhere, uh, but it does bear repeating. Malaysia has a ticking retirement time bomb in that A, there are around 14 million working age Malaysians who do not have any retirement savings, i.e. they're not contributing to any pension funds, whether it's the EPF or the co-op. B, of the 10 million Malaysians who do have some form of retirement savings, uh, most of them do not have enough, however, to retire on. And C, Malaysia is also a rapidly aging population. According to a recent World Bank study, in 30 short years, around one in every five Malaysians will be over the age of 65, making Malaysia a super aged nation. And so this national conundrum forms the basis of my conversation with a gentleman named Noh Hisham Hussein. Now, Hisham is a long-time professional acquaintance. He's also the chief strategy officer at the EPF, the Employees Provident Fund. It's also Malaysia's largest pension fund, which caters to the private sector. The following is my conversation with Hisham. But before we begin, uh, one small request if possible. If you're inspired or you learned something or derived some value from the content that I produce on this channel, if you can, please do like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, it will be a huge help if you can do this. So I can continue to reach out to people like Hisham to share their stories so that we can all learn from each other and hopefully make the world a slightly better place. Thanks again and take care. Hisham, thanks for doing this. Um, you know, we've been, obviously, we've known each other a very long time. Yep. And uh, you're now in the quite choice position of being Chief Strategy Officer at EPF. Um, but I want to discuss something which is a little bit off the norm from this mm. podcast typically with you. Because normally I talk to people about investment and mm. entrepreneurship and leadership. But you know, obviously, investments and, and entrepreneurship Hmm. And deals with the top line, which hmm. is incoming income, right? Yep. But a lot of people, bizarrely, they don't do enough in terms of planning for their financial futures, yep. for their retirement, and it comes sooner than expected. Yes. And this is Malaysia's conundrum because, I, as I understand it, Malaysia's, Malaysians generally don't have enough money for retirement. That's correct. And they're living longer, mm -hmm. and they've got healthcare costs to look after, mm -hmm. and they've also got their dependents to take care of. Yep. So if we can... Let, can we start with a, a snapshot from you in terms of Malaysian retirement positions from the perspective of EPF? Okay. How uh, bad or how good are we? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, how bad? Well, um, let me put it this way. Um, EPF is supposed to be the um, retirement fund for uh, the private sector. So you have the public sector pension, you have the private sector that's covered by EPF. Um, but when you think about the number of people who actually fit that description, okay, somebody who actually goes to work 9 to 5, earns a salary, they get deductions for EPF and SOXO and HRDF and whatever, what have you, right? Um, that is only at currently only roughly about 8.4 million people. Okay, so 8.4 million plus the civil service, about 1.6, we have close to about 10. Okay. Right? That leaves 6 million people who aren't covered by anything. That's the working age population, That's right? the working age population that's actually in the labor force. If you talk about the working age population as a whole, mm -hmm. that's 20, close to 24 million. That's the grey economy, the uh, freelancers and the gig mm, guys, right? Not necessarily, no. That would be the students. That would be unpaid family workers. You know, Mothers, for example. Mothers. Um, yes, housewives specifically. Housewives, so yes. There's roughly about 2 million housewives, I believe, who are not working. Uh, there's another 3 or 4 million students who are, you know, they, they're still studying and, you know, they're not covered by anything. Mm. So out of uh, adult population of 24 million, we only have about 10 million who have any kind of coverage. And obviously, if you're not under this system, you're not going to accumulate savings for your retirement, right? Uh, and um, obviously, we've been talking, I mean, EPF has been talking a great deal about adequacy. Um, coverage is one issue, adequacy another. Adequacy, um, of course, is whether you have actually have enough for retirement. And the basic standard we use for that is what we call the basic savings requirement, which is basically the minimum pension for 20 years. So 1,000 ringgit a month for 12 months for 20 years comes up to 240,000 ringgit. But, you know, in this day and age, nobody can live on the minimum pension. You know, who can live on 1,000 ringgit a month, especially in KL? Impossible. Yeah. So what we've done is that we, we've talked to uh, University of Malaya. We, we have a center that we, we, we actually fund. 
Um, and what they've done uh, over the course of the last three or four years or so is actually try to enumerate how much does it actually cost to live in various cities um, at the minimum standard. So we're talking about basically uh, literally just above the poverty line. When we talk about um, not nutritional deficiency, but also, you know, you're, you're talking about community engagement, have a little bit of savings, you know, have a little bit of entertainment for a while. So this is adequate. Uh, say uh, uh, standard of living. Typical and lifestyle issues are makan yeah. and yeah, 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 no, I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you, you could argue about ten dollar haircuts versus thirty dollar haircuts, right? Um, you know, for example, or you know, fifteen dollar cups of coffee versus you know, the exactly, f yeah, five. Yeah. So you know, you try to take the minimum of that and, and take living expenses uh, uh, into consideration as well, and the number comes up to five hundred eighty thousand ringgit for KL. Wow, six hundred thousand ringgit, close to yeah. six hundred thousand ringgit. Um, so that's about three thousand ringgit per month, lah, which is the yes. minimum per person, right? Minimum for one person. Oh, well, what we've done is we looked at it from, uh, uh, well, you can do that from a, a single person. You can do that from because what we did it was we based it on different household sizes and household types. So this one, I believe, is based on a senior couple. So it's close to about three thousand ringgit per month for a couple. For a couple. Okay, and that's as it stands now, not yeah. not accounting for inflation. Not accounting for inflation, not accounting for investment, uh, and it's only for 20 years, right? You still have tail risk, and what I mean by tail risk is that there's always a risk that you exceed those 20 years. I mean, yeah. So you live beyond 75. You live beyond 75. So the numbers right now is that roughly about 95 percent of women and about 90 percent, about 90 percent of men, will actually reach retirement age, right? 50 percent of them will reach the median. Uh, life expectancy, which is 73, 74 for men and about 77 for women. But a significant portion of those those cohorts will actually exceed 80. So you've got roughly about 40% of women and about 30 plus percent of men who will actually exceed 80 years old. So nearly half of those guys who live to retirement age yeah. will pass 75 years old. Will pass 75 years old and, and I think at least one third will pass 80. So, so the number six hundred thousand yeah. so is you know like that yeah yeah um, and if you add on those years then it becomes obviously a lot more so there's a huge mismatch about where we think the minimum savings rate is yeah. in terms of actualities yeah. and this is as it stands now without stands now. accounting for inflation yeah. or even people getting older beyond what they think they're gonna right right and this is living expenses we're not talking about medical right uh, we're not talking about um, critical illnesses. Uh, we're not talking about, uh, we assume that you are, have your own house, right? Uh, so this is just purely living expenses, you know, being part of the community. And um, when we use that standard, 3% of EPF members meet that standard. Wow. 3%? Just 3%. So Malaysia is facing a ticking time bomb. We are facing a ticking time bomb in terms of social yeah. parachutes for yeah. majority of Malaysians. Yeah, uh, and and to be honest, I don't think it's a ticking time bomb. It's already exploded. It's a t yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and I think the 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 thing about this is obviously we're not a Western country where everything is provided for. You know, you have to provide for yourself, and the government provides for you and everything. Uh, we've always depended on community support. We've always depended on family support. When you co when you go back to your kampung, is your sedara, your adibrade, and everything. That, that those are the ones who actually support you. So having income isn't so critical. You have your kebun, so you can grow something and, and use that for, for sustenance. But those systems are breaking down as we go. As we urbanize, as Malaysia becomes more developed, people move to urban centers. They lose that community support. They lose that family support. And when, you know, you could always go back to retire, but then you, you actually lose those, um, I think, family connections and everything because people just move away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go yeah. abroad for better okay. jobs. Exactly. And um, I, I think we found that with some of the statistics when we talk about um, the age profile of different states, the, the, the urban centers are getting younger, the outlying states are getting older. So there is this internal migration where the young people come to the cities to work. Right? But the, the people who are left behind uh, are, you know, they have less support. I think. So it's, um, um, we're dealing with a few trends here. I think one, obviously, aging is one of them, but also, you know, you're talking about, you know, changing patterns of economic behavior and all that. So, you know, pe people are getting married less, they're having less children. Um, and again, so you're losing that. That hurts the community support. Correct. Yeah. Right. 
and you you lose that because a lot of people just rely on their children. Your children is your retirement plan. Yeah. Right. And if you have less children, obviously the the you know the demands on them will be a, a lot greater. Yeah, so I was yeah. watching you on Ibrahim Sunny last night to prepare for this discussion, and uh, you you found it quite uh, anomalous that during the lockdowns and pandemic, you know, but roughly about two years, when you yeah, have people in close proximity, you'd yeah. assume that birth rates would spike, but yeah. actually the reverse happened. Exactly. And you you seem quite surprised, but but actually I, I wasn't because because obviously people were very stressed out. Yes. And they were very concerned about the future. Yeah. They couldn't see beyond the tomorrow because. Yeah. When you when you're not confident about the future, mm -hmm. you're not going to bring another dependent into the world, exactly. right? And that's troublesome as well. Yeah, exactly. And 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 it's expensive. It's uh, expensive. It's very expensive bringing up children. Um, again, going back to the numbers that we were talking about, um, because we looked at um, uh, families at different stages of life and 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 um, um, with different dependencies. So, the minimum expenditure amount that a family needs uh, over a given month goes up by roughly about between 900 to 1,000 ringgit per child. Per child. Yeah. Per child. Uh, and you're not even talking about education, f you know, future education savings or whatever, right? It's just the expenditure now. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of, um, I think, angst within the Malaysia political scene right now. Because the people who, if you look at the age profile, right, uh, the bulk of the population is between the ages of 30 and 40. And 30 or 40 is when you first get your home, mm -hmm. you first start a family. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, can I just get you to repeat that? So the majority of Malaysians, um, age-wise, demographically yeah. speaking, is 30 to 40 years old. 30 to 40 years old. And how many percent is that? Um, it's Well, relatively speaking, it's not that big. I think it's about 20-something. Okay, I, I so a fifth, one out of every five Malaysians is 30 to 40 years old. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of retirement planning? Well, one thing is that if you're 30, 40 years old, you just start, you know, you're making your first big commitments, buying a house, starting a family, um, uh, bringing children into the world, you know, paying for the education, healthcare, and all that. Um, and that goes back to, I, th I think, some of the things that you mentioned just now about the categorization of households, right? Mm -hmm. right? So you could be a T20 household, supposedly T20. So you're earning maybe uh, 15,000 ringgit a month. But if you've got four children and you've got a house to pay for, you've got education to pay for, you're not actually very well off. It gets tight. It gets very tight. And you compare that with somebody, say, a single person who's living on 4,000 ringgit will be categorized as B40. He's mm. not necessarily poor mm. because he's got no dependents. Mm. So right. He's got more disposable than Correct. the next guy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's disposable income that really drives people's behavior. So um, I want to I want to try and zoom out because you talk about how ninety seven percent of Malaysians within the working age population, and that's only just is that is that all twenty over million Malaysians you're talking about, or no, is it just the eight point six? That's just the EPF members. Just so the EPF. We have roughly about fifteen million plus members, mm -hmm. right? So we don't cover everybody. Okay. Um, and out of that, only three percent actually meet the standard. So only three percent of that fifteen million people meet the minimum, which is two hundred forty thousand ringgit. Uh, they'll be the six hundred thousand. 600,000? Yeah. Okay. Si only 3% of Malaysians have that 600,000 ringgit in their accounts at the age of 55. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this is a huge structural problem yes. because there's, there's a few factors at play here, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, they're not making enough money to set aside yep. in EPF. The money that they have that they're making is also diminishing in value against um, you know, the global currencies, the Sing dollar, the US dollar, whatever, mm -hmm. on an annual basis. And there's also the inflationary costs. Yep. Things are going up every year. In yep. fact, in the last two years, they've gone up by an order of magnitude. I can't even imagine. At a real level, I don't talk about CPI official numbers, right? Mm. At a real level. So, so this basically commands the attention of the policymakers in Malaysia. Yep. We've got to increase the wages. We've got to address the d diminishing value of the ringgit. Mm. And we've also got to address inflationary costs, mm. which then makes the job Infinitely harder. Hmm. Well, how, how, are you, how are you looking at the, all these issues? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, we could be here all day talking about that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, within the limited sphere of, you know, just social protection, mm -hmm. uh, there are obviously a lot of gaps that we have. Um, uh, and I think the, the key, po well, retirement is one of them. Right? Uh, but also when you talk about uh, during your working life, you know, we don't we don't have adequate support uh, for people while they're working as well. There's when we look at that, there's about roughly about nine different pillars of social protection. Maternity is not covered at all. Wow. 
So all. what's covered? What's the nine? Um, you have did you have retirement? You have um, invalidity. I, I can't recall all of them offhand. Mm -hmm. um, the key unemployment, ones, unemployment, unemployment. Okay. That's Soxo, um, isn't it? That's Soxo. Yeah. But Soxo has the same problem we do. Uh, they don't cover everybody, right? Um, so even though you're working, mm -hmm. quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, certain categories of workers are excluded, right? So if you're a gig worker. You can do it on a voluntary basis, mm -hmm. but it's not mandatory. They're mm -hmm. trying to make it mandatory now. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working freelance, you don't get it. If mm -hmm. you're an agricultural worker, you're excluded. Right? That's bizarre. Um, because you're not earning a salary. Mm. Right? It's, mm. It depends on the yeah. seasons, right? It's the definitions. Yeah. So it, it goes back to how you're earning your income. Um, you know, petani uh, nelayan, they, they, they're not covered by SOXO or EPF. Um, foreign workers, obviously. Um, patchy coverage, uh, even though they do contribute to the economy. Contract workers, huge, huge um, category. So under the Employment Act, there's two types of employment contracts. One's contract of service, one's contract for service. So, sorry, getting into the yeah, legal side. And four, yeah. uh, contract of service is covered under EPF as well. Contract for service, which is like a contractual obligation to provide something, you know, like a consultant. Mm. Say for three months. Yeah, for three yeah. months, whatever, uh, is not covered. But it's, this definition is abused. So... Some people under contract for service actually come in nine to five, provides you know work. Uh, mm. There's no time limit, mm. um, uh, so they don't pay EPF or they. No, or the, well, the employers, yeah. the employers typically are the ones who abuse that, right? Yes. Because they don't have to make the mandatory obligations. Well, some, some, I think some Malaysians actually prefer because they don't want they to prefer to have higher yeah. disposable income rather than having the yeah. deductions. But as a result, they don't contribute to EPF. They and don't contribute. After thirty years, bam, time flies very fast. Yes. On the map, uh, right? No, no cash. No cash. Um, and I think, um, um, uh, one, sorry, I had a thought on the top of my head. Um, what was it? Ah, uh, just as an example of uh, the gaps that we have, during the height of COVID, uh, you know, we had roughly an increase of about 300,000 unemployed. And we had something like 2 million to 3 million people who were on furlough. In other words, they couldn't work um, and they weren't getting a salary. Have you looked upon those numbers in terms of now? Have they been rehired? Uh, not so much, because if you're on furlough, you're, actually, you're still employed. Oh, so what happened? That, that, that's the two million you're talking about. Two million you're talking about, yeah. Okay. S but when we talk about unemployment benefits, because we, had an, uh, we have an, unemployment, insu we have an mm. employment insurance system under SOXO, mm. right? The peak was 170k. So massive gap. People mm. were not work weren't, weren't able to work. Um, they weren't getting any income, and yet the system doesn't cover them. So when you say the time bomb has exploded, right, and you're literally talking about maybe millions of people who are now living hand to mouth, maybe way below the poverty line, yeah. how are they getting by right now? Well, um, again, we're talking about the family support, right? So kids and, and kids, relatives helping yes. to pay for expenses and Correct. maybe living in their house. Correct. And Correct. So... That's happening already. I mean, I, I, we're seeing it with um, working adults now. They are the sandwich generation. Mm. They're having to support both their parents as well as their children. I presume you as well. Well, I'm, I'm not so bad because I think my, my, my parents were relatively well off. Mm. Um, so uh, we didn't have to uh, provide for them, I think, from an, on, from an income perspective. Mm -hmm. You still have to, do, to help them out with... Um, cause I mean, my father passed away about three years ago. Uh, no, sorry, four years ago now. Um, but he, again, he had a lot of savings, he had his house and everything, so no issue. My mother has Alzheimer's, uh, so we, we actually, my sister actually has to take care of her at the moment. Uh, mm. But again, income isn't a problem for us, it's more about that emotional support, that medical support. Yeah. So let's try and zoom out, right? What are the main social issues at play here? One, of course, is your salaries are not high enough. Correct. The other one is that you don't have the financial literacy to say, right. Hey, I mean, if I'm going to make ten bucks, I'm going to set aside five for savings, stroke investment, yeah. Yeah. and then manage my costs. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't do that. Even the rich guys, even the successful. Yes, and, and it's quite surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so how how do we address that? Is it does the responsibility for that fall on the individual, or is that, does that fall on the state? Um, I would say it's more on the individual. There's only so much that the state can do. You can provide all the systems you want, but if somebody doesn't know how to use it, then, then that's a problem. Um, I think just going back to your wage issue, uh, just, just to give the numbers, right? Uh, within the EPF system, roughly about 50% earn less than 2,300 ringgit. 
So the, that's the salary. median right now. Yes. So the median at a national level, is income wise, is 2,300 ringgit per month. Per month. Which is actually quite a bit of an improvement. Um, you know, um, I, I know people are quite surprised at how low wages actually are when they look at it because they, they're, they're used to thinking that's, li li that's literally 500 US bucks a month. Yeah. yeah. And, I and if you get 4,005, I think uh, if you're roughly around 5,000 ringgit, you're already T20. Wow. Uh, within the e with, in terms so of So how are these guys getting by? Okay, th don't talk about Klang Valley. Lah, okay? mm. Talk about, say, Bintulu or Pirate mm. Punta, right? Right. I mean, even there, it's not cheap anymore. Yep. I was in Johor two, six months ago. It's off the scale in terms of the cost. And I'm talking about Kampung, you know. Yes. Right? Uh, uh, spillover from Singapore, but that's yeah. a different yeah, story. Yeah, 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 but <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. so <laughs> how? I, I, I think um, um, one is that... Um, despite the fact that salaries are low, the growth is actually fairly strong. Wage growth? Yes. It is. Because the base is so low lah. Yes, the base is low. Okay. So, and of course we've had the economic reopening and um, I think people are going out to work again and things are, are starting to open up. And Wage growth has actually been fairly strong. The 2,300 ringgit we're talking about median, I mean that's today. To me that's very encouraging because three years ago it was under 2,000. Oh. Right? So, progress is being made. Uh, even though you know we, we're still a low wage economy, uh, we're seeing progress. I think, especially at the bottom end, and I think it goes back to what I was saying just now about the thirty and forty, right? Um, where we find growth the slowest is actually in the middle. Mm. So we find good growth at the bottom. We're finding good growth at the top, but growth in the middle, basically around just above the median. That, that range is what three roughly to between two thousand ringgit to four thousand ringgit. That's four? where the growth is the slowest. And these are the guys that are stuck in middle management or no, not I even mean, middle management. Right? Not even middle management. You can, you, I mean, I, I, just to, dis, just to um, um, uh, shine a little bit of light on the reality of the Malaysian labor market, right? Only about 20% of the labor force has a degree. Actually, a bit less, right? So even when we talk middle management, is already T20, mm. right? Yeah. Um, the median Malaysian worker is somebody with SPM, right? Uh, probably been working for 15 years. Well, well that, that reality is a propagation of the realities because if you don't come from a background where you can pay for an education, yeah. it's unlikely that your children, your progeny, can also pay for an education because you're stuck in that band. Yeah. It's very hard to come out of where you are born into, right. right? Because you just don't have the opportunities. You've got to go out and yes. work because your parents are you know, tooth and nail, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that's been, uh, um, uh, I think, confirmed by some of the studies on social mobility in Malaysia. Mm. We do find social mobility over time, um, but that was the previous generation. So the current generation seems a bit stuck, right? Um, this is probably the first generation in Malaysia where you might not be better off than your parents. I'm starting to see that as yeah. a reality because while they can't afford to buy a house, yes. um, entry levels for for property is just ridiculous, Correct. right? Um, Bringing maybe children maybe, becomes a lot more expensive. Yeah, um, cost of living is just crazy off the scale. In, yeah. And if they want to move to the city, that's just like murder, right? Because, yes. because uh, urban costs are ridiculous. Yes. Maybe they don't want to buy a car because they've got public transport, and which is pretty good. And maybe Grab uh, well, is, a, is a thing for them as well. Yeah. So that's maybe that interplays as well, yeah. right? Possibly. So but yeah, the current yeah. generation have been really, really hard. Yes, they do. Uh, not compared to my time, I think, yes, it's much harder today than it was. And Unless our parents, because we are roughly the same age, right? Yeah. Our parents, even though they didn't make a lot of money, they could afford to buy a house. Yes. I mean, the house I'm staying in was built in 1972. cost 30,000, 20,000 20, ringgit in those days. Yes. Okay lah, yeah. you know. Decent, decent, decent location. De decent lah, right? Yes. Hmm. Well, not crazy I, value wise, right? Yeah, I know. I think my, my parents bought their house at uh, around 40,000 ringgit. Yeah. Uh, of course, back then people thought they were crazy because yeah. it was way in the outskirts. Yeah, yeah. But it's now it's right in the middle. Ada tanah lah, right? Yeah, ada tanah yeah. and all. Yeah. So what do we do? Because, and and that's a very very small granular domestic level discussion we're having yeah. now, right? Yeah. But then when you zoom out, and you look at the ringgit in terms of um, other national currencies, mm -hmm. we lose, I think, at an average basis. One to two percent of value against the Sing dollar every year. That's deliberate. 
that's deliberate. Okay, for, okay, that's another big discussion in terms of exports and Malaysia's yeah, well, income. Well, it's and really, I mean, it has more to do with Singapore's monetary policy, nothing to do yeah, with us. But yeah, that, I wouldn't compare against the Singapore. Yeah, okay. So let's compare against the US dollar, right? right. Um, okay, it, it's been fluctuating, but generally speaking, it's been decreasing in value yeah. against the dollar. Mm. And we even hit 4.75 to the dollar literally six months ago. Yep. We've come back to about 4.25. 4.5 now. But then Mahadeya pegged it at 3.8. Yes. And at some point, we were 2.5. Yes. So over the long term, we have been losing value against the, you know, the reserve currency of the world, right? Yes. And that also is troublesome. Well, uh, that is not a problem unique to Malaysia. Uh, that it's is, a global problem. It's a global right? phenomenon because mm. the dollar has been strengthening against everything. Mm. Uh, with very, very few exceptions. I mean, Hong Kong obviously pegs to the dollar, so they've been keeping up. Uh, uh, Singapore's monetary policy actually requires them to actually appreciate mm. against reserve currency, so they're actually gaining as well. Mm. But most other currencies have actually fallen in tandem. Um, we're roughly average, I think, in terms of depreciation against the dollar. So it's not that bad. At a global level. Uh. At a global level. But we're still all falling against the dollar. Yes. Even uh, though the dollar itself is a bit shaky and a bit fragile because its debt levels are off the scale. But that's again another discussion, that's right? Another discussion. Okay. So, so the lesson to Malaysians is that skill up, get an education, earn more money, and therefore be able, able to put more money into your retirement savings, right? Yes. Is that the discussion, generally speaking? Um, I would say only partly true. Uh, getting in, uh, the getting a degree doesn't mean y you know how to manage money. Right? Okay, so there's two parts, right? Make more money and manage your money better. Yes. Okay. So, getting the income is one thing, uh, and we do know stories of you know high income individuals. They just can't control their commitments. Yeah. Uh, spend too much and then end up with you know nothing at retirement. Yeah, lifestyles move quickly, more quickly than yes. their income Correct. increments. Yeah. Correct. So, and so it's, it's actually a, a, a societal problem and, and it goes back to how our brains work. And um, uh, you know, they use this technical term, they call it hyperbolic discounting, which means that you don't discount future events, uh, sorry, you discount future events more than you do uh, than the present. Or in other words, we have a presence bias. Yeah, so basically yeah. you spend more money now you don't think of the future. Basically. You don't. You don't plan for the future because it's too far away. It's a different mm. person that you're talking mm. about. Mm. Your, your, you at forty or you at fifty is a totally alien concept to somebody who's twenty years old. Absolutely, because right? you have no conception of what that's like, mm. right? and you can't figure out. Okay, you know, you don't have enough life experience to understand that these things need to be planned for way ahead. But then, equally, the guy who's at forty years old, who's yeah. made VP, who's made SVP, right, and he's right. a million, twenty thousand, thirty thousand uh, ringgit a month. Yes. And he can't figure out at 60, my income drops to zero. But he should, <laughs> yes. because he's yes. been around the block at least once by the age of 40, right? Or he should. Yes. He should, right? Yes. But why don't they? I think the realization only hits, you know, when you get closer to retirement. So when you hit your mid-40s, you start realizing, uh -oh. oh no. Mm. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, the kids are out, you know, your commitments start falling off. You know, you've par partially paid off your house, you've, you've got your kids in, in you know, hopefully going through university or, or at least going through secondary school. Assuming you see, you see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think, yeah. in terms of commitments. And then you suddenly realize, okay, what do I do next? Right? Um, and that's when the panic starts setting in, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think. And, and, and going back to what we're talking about, taking time out, we have a million EPF members who are aged between 45 to 55, mm -hmm. who have less than 50,000 ringgit. Sorry, a million, a million members, 45 to 55, who have less than? 50,000 ringgit. Wow. So these are the ones whose alarm bells are going off already. Yeah, um, and, and, and you know, because you go back to, you know, only 3% mm -hmm. uh, qualified. But if you look at the rest of the distribution, the inequality is huge. Is there a possibility that there could be a silver lining here? In the sense that I know Malaysians who also don't contribute to EPF for various reasons. Yeah but who have other assets outside, yep. maybe even offshore, who knows, right? Yep. Is, is, that, is that too much of a stretch to assume that there's a generality or is that a minority? It's a minority. Yeah. Because we know roughly about, um, we've seen, I've seen some of the figures on inequality in terms of um, wealth distribution uh, in various funds. Uh, we know about property. There is a lot of inequality there as well. They're even higher than EPF. 
What do you mean property inequality? I don't understand. Um, basically, if um, there's, I believe, something like seven, 8 million dwellings in Malaysia, mm -hmm. right? But the highest, I think, in terms of value, you're basically talking about Klang Valley, mm -hmm. Penang, maybe. Mm -hmm. Even JP isn't that, that expensive, right? So you've got extremely high prices in certain areas. And in other areas, you can't sell a house, you know, no matter how much you try. Can't sell. Can't it's sell. Just it's, it's um, you know, the same house in, say, Kuala Terengganu versus in KL will probably be about three times difference in price. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're talking about the disparity in values between yes. rural and urban, right? Right, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, if you're holding a house in, in KL versus holding a house in KT, yeah, I mean... You're basically underwater la, in yeah. a big way, right? Yeah. Um, no, in, in the sense that your wealth accumulation is a lot slower, right? Mm. Especially if you're holding landed property versus, say, apartments or condos, mm. right? Landed apartment always, uh, sorry, landed property generally does tend to continue to go up. Mm. Condos, apartments, they tend to go up in spurts and then you have this fallow period where it doesn't go up at all, mm. right? Mm. And we're seeing that now in, in the property market today. Uh, Double-storey housing, still, okay. Terrace housing, still going up. Mm. But if you, if you own a condo, if you own an apartment, or you own a flat, they're going nowhere. Well, then, then the financial advisor will say, well, go and rent out those units, or at least Airbnb it or something, get some income. But the problem is the income from that is also at a negative carry, right? Yes, because it's not enough to cover your... Exactly. The costs are still higher than your income. Correct. And you're still having to fund the difference right. there. And you still have to live somewhere. You still have to live somewhere, that's yeah. right. That's right. And if you live in one of those, then you're paying for that, plus your yeah. investment properties, yeah. which underwater. Yeah. But I think the, the, the reality of the, the situation is that for most people, they only have one house. Mm. Right? Mm. They, they don't actually have that portfolio. I mean, it's really, really rare to have more than one. Um, I, I think in terms of coming back to that issue of managing your wealth and investments, um, it's something that needs to be done when you're young. You have to do it very deliberately. Uh, because I think what we find is a lot of people uh, tend to fall for these get-rich-quick schemes, right? Because they, they don't understand risk, they don't understand the, the relationship between risk and return. Uh, they don't understand, um, I think, um, what const how to construct an investment portfolio. Because I think that's the, 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 the fundamental, I think, basis of all this, is that you have to look at your assets as an investment portfolio. And you have to understand how to construct that portfolio. This whole idea about the education sector being in real need of systemic reform mm -hmm. has been a discussion for many, many years, right? And, you know, uh, the conventional discussion has been on, you know, preparing the child or the, the student for the future, um, you know, uh, STEM subjects and, you know, s critical thinking and all that. That's one equation. Mm -hmm. But at a personal level, I've also believed that there should be soft skills introduced at a, yes. at a very early level. Yes social skills, interpersonal skills, yes. because oftentimes I see people who succeed in the workforce are not so much those who are technically proficient, Correct. but those who can manage up and manage down and manage mm -hmm. sideways, yes. and they get promoted faster, yes. bizarrely enough, right? Yeah. The other thing that people should also learn at a very young level should be financial skills. Yeah. And this, to me, is a fundamental omission in education, yes. not just in Malaysia, it's global. Yes. In America, they don't even teach financial skills mm -hmm. at a young level. No. You, you're, you're basically left to fend for yourself, mm -hmm. and that's that's something we should do, but we don't. Yeah. You earn 10 ringgit, you spend as little of that as possible, you forego your wants and mm -hmm. your needs. Mm -hmm. Don't buy the iPhone for God's sakes, right? <laughs> don't go to Starbucks for God's sakes, right? Set aside at least half for savings and investment, yeah. but we don't do that. The flip side happens, right? And, and, and it goes back to, um, I think, um, um, understanding what the, the, the purpose of education actually is and understanding how the brain actually develops in the person, right? I mean, you spoke about soft skills, you talk about those um, um, foregoing, that yeah. instant gratification. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know when that is actually built into a person? Between the ages of three to five. Okay, so the parent is the one who it's is saying, so when the child cries, just give him or her, give the child the... Instant gratification. Instant gratification, right? That's right. Because then they get it, right? Correct. Yeah. And and what what do we what would we hope to do with, with when we send our kids to ed, to um, um, preschool, right? We want them to interact, right? We want them to because the purpose of you know I mean you know I, I think 
our mistake is looking at preschool as an extension of primary school or a prelude to primary school, right? We just bring the syllabus down mm. faster, mm. right? And that's not correct because the purpose of preschool during that ages of three to five is to teach interaction, to teach interaction, mm. soft skills, communication skills, yeah. um, negotiate. Correct. Give me that pram, <laughs> otherwise yeah. I'm going to cry. Because that, that's the way the brain actually develops. Yeah. You know, that's, how, that's when the brain actually picks up on all these skills. It's only roughly when you get to six or seven years old is they start developing cognitive skills. And that's when you want to put in the knowledge uh, that you want to transfer to children, right? Afterwards, not during preschool. Preschool is about the, the soft skills part. And that's all interaction is play. It's, you know, all the things that, you know, kids are supposed to do. Yeah. Kids want to play, and yeah. th that's a natural instinct, and yeah. that is when they actually learn all these skills. So put simply, what you're talking about is we, as individuals, it's our responsibility to, to manage our top line, which is our income growth, income. right? Yeah. And to manage our bottom line, our cost, which is basically how much we spend versus right. how much we save and invest. Yeah. And oftentimes, in fact, in the majority of the time, Malaysians just don't do that well enough. No, and, and we, we just completed our, our latest financial literacy survey. Mm. And, okay, in Singapore, roughly about 70-something percent of people pass this test. So it's a standardized test, right? Uh, in Malaysia, only about 29 percent pass. So in Singapore, 7 out of 10 are financially literate. In Malaysia, 3 out of 10 are financially 10, literate. Correct. What are the, are, are, is it the same kind of test that you apply it's, here? Uh, well, well, Singapore? Ours was slightly harder. <laughs> ours is hard. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. um, but what are some of those tests? Uh, it's a very simple. Do you understand the difference between interest and uh, uh, um, uh, simple interest and compound interest, for example? Right? Okay, so that, that's quite hard. I, simple interest and compound interest. <laughs> so, for example, if you get, um, uh, assume you get a 5% return on a 100, 100 ringgit deposit, right? Okay. After one year, is it higher than 105, lower than 105, you know, those kinds of questions. That's not easy also, huh? It's very basic, but yeah, it's not very... Uh, it's not well, easy. I, I wouldn't yeah. say it was easy, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's understanding the concepts. Okay. Right? So um, credit cards, compound interest can also work against you when you apply with credit cards, right? Which is a big problem. Yes, yeah. because it's, they, they advertise 1.5% per, per month. Yeah, but then if you leave your money in EPF, yeah. it compounds at at least 5%, give or take, every year. And you can double your money in 20 years. Exactly. Something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think most people just understand, they understand simple interest, they don't understand compound. Mm. And, and the value of saving is actually taking advantage of the compounding. Effect, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that's why it's, um, it's very beneficial to start as, a, as early as possible. Yeah. Right? Um, I, mean, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett very famously bought his first stock when he was 12 years old. <laughs> and he's, he's probably left it there in yeah. the last... I don't know, 70 years. Yeah. And imagine yeah. the compound growth of yeah. dividends and bonuses and share issues and yeah. all these things is ridiculous. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. And that's how you, you build your wealth, step by step, and then you take advantage of that compounding. Okay, so to me, right, um, when, when it comes to the whole idea of, in, of investing and taking care of your future, to me, the order is this. Okay, it's all about, it's all about the, this, the order of things, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, first of all, it's insurance, mm -hmm. personal health insurance. First, lah, once you start working, right? Yeah. Personal health insurance, um, property, mm -hmm. um, shares, maybe, and then beyond that, whatever else, right? Is is what do you think? Is that in, in order terms? Is that the appropriate way? I think yeah. Um, I would say that things yeah. that cars last, okay? <laughs> yes. No car last, okay? Credit card last, right? Well, uh, well car, cars are are for, you know for transport, yes. Mm -hmm. So yep. buy an old banger. Don't care what people think about you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Get a 10, 20 year old proton. I, I, I made the mistake of buying a new car when I was when I first started working. Never Same. again. Exactly. Same. Never again. Same. After that, it was all secondhand. Same. Uh, Same. Um, I, I think you know you look at um, again you look at the relationship between risk and return, right? When you're building a portfolio, you want uh, start with a base of very low risk um, asset. Right? Okay. So uh, property could be one of them, but you have to be careful about location. Yeah. EPF is another because okay. it's capital Start guaranteed. Start contributing as early as possible. Correct. It's capital guaranteed. You want that as a base. Right? Uh, then you go progressively higher in terms of risk and return. Because you do, especially when you're young, you have time to recover uh, if you know, something goes wrong. So you can take on a, a higher portion of higher risk. And it goes back to, so you build it up from there. You have a safe area, so EPF and the housing or whatever, unit trust, mm. right? 
Okay. Then, then maybe equity. Okay. Can I just? Can I just? Yeah. At the risk of of uh, incurring the wrath of many people, to me, unit trust is is a pretty bad investment. It depends on which manager you're going with. I would say ETFs are. ETFs decent. are pretty good. ETFs are pretty good. The reason I'm I've got a bu- something against unit trust, and again, as you say, it's different. It's the different manager, right? Yeah. It's the cost structure of unit trust. Yes. They charge you too much. Of course. Yeah, but ETFs, as you say, charge little less nothing, yes. which is good. Yeah. So if you buy a unit trust and you're paying the manager 1.4, 1.5% a year, yeah. even when the value drops, that's unfair. Yes. Right? Yeah. That's unfair. You've got entry charges, you've got management charges, you've got exit charges, yeah. you've got switching charges. Yes. Way too many charges. Yes. I don't like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. So ETFs is obviously one big... Uh, the, the opposite of that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I, I would build it based on those. Um, you could look at uh, certain unit trusts with better alpha, I mean, yeah. depending yeah. on your risk appetite. Yeah. Right? And then you st- and then maybe about five percent, you start going into other stuff like gold or Bitcoin or whatever. Mm. You know, mm. those are the. Th- this is the money you can afford to lose. What about things like stocks and all that? What's your view on that? Um, well, I'm barred from trading, so. Okay. <laughs> of course, yeah. Unfortunately, yes. right. Yeah. So, but. Yes, you can, uh, especially if you're looking at uh, decent dis- dividend yield. Mm. Right? Mm. You could take a you know look at you know high growth stocks, especially if you're younger. Mm. Right? You know, just take a view, put it in, do your research. Um, but I, I find that to be very time intensive. Unless you want to do that full time, it's better to off going into an ETF. Yeah, well, but for me, I mean, I, again, I mean, this is my personal recommendation: is that. You have to pay as much attention to your retirement as you do your health. Yes. You know, caring for your loved ones because it's your responsibility. Correct. Because if you're not liquid, yeah. you can't take care of people. You can't take yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. So it's it's your responsibility to look after your financial health as well as your physical health, right? Yeah. And that means you have to study those things. Yeah. Study the property market. Study the share market. Yeah. Study the crypto market. Yeah. Right. And understand what's at stake. Yeah. And, and if you don't understand something, please don't invest. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm. But you must because if you don't, then you end up at age fifty-five with less than fifty thousand ringgit in your account, and that's problematic. Yes, you course. can't take care of yourself. Yeah, because I, I think fundamentally, I, I think our internal view is that given the numbers, we can cover. We're trying to cover as many people as possible. Okay. The reality is that ne- most people will never reach an adequate level of retirement savings within the EPF system, right? So from a policy perspective, we need to fill in the gaps, right? So EP, the, I think the ILO World Bank um, schema has, uh, they call it a multi-pillar system. So EPF is pillar two. This is a, a contributory um, retirement savings. Mm-hmm. Uh, LTAT is the same. Um, SOXO is a totally different branch of social insurance. Um, and then you have PRS above that. That's a pet pillar three. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, other forms of savings with pillar four. We do not have pillar one, which is a, a voluntary. Sorry, it's a contributory pension. Okay, self is a voluntary one. Uh, not necessarily voluntary. Uh, I would say it's a mandatory one that covers everybody. We don't have a pillar one. We have a very small pillar zero. Pillar zero would be uh, tax financed uh, support. Okay, like in the Western countries. Like in Western countries. Okay. So there's no national pension. Uh, there's no national contributory pension. So those are the t- first two pillars of uh, a, a full retirement uh, system. Because we've got the um, um, civil service pension structure on one side, you've got yeah. the B- EPF on the yeah. private sector side, right. and you don't have a national level, which is why it's some people fall off the in between the cracks, right? right. The grey economy and right. all that, all that stuff, right? right. So, so which direction is the EPF moving? Is it towards pillar zero and pillar one? We can't wow. do pillar zero because we're obviously we're not tax finance. Um, I but think you can, f- right? I mean... You could. We could manage the money, but we no, can't do it. No, no, EPF can't do that, but yeah. at a country level, they can consider it, right? At a country level, it, yes. Right? Of course they can. But that, that uh, implies uh, certain trade-offs, because if you want to do uh, a full-scale national pension that is tax finance, you need to have the taxes to support it. Which we don't, because Which we, do, we have. do have a too narrow tax base. Yes, we have a very narrow tax base, and even then, I think the tax rates are fairly low relative to what yeah, Europeans do. Uh, that c- comes back to the question of do we want a European system? So, so, so let's talk about the European system for yeah. now, right? Because the European system, a bit like Australia as well, yeah. very high tax rates, yes. but in return you get fantastic 
services, right? Public services, Correct. including housing, including mm. social welfare systems. Correct. Why doesn't, why, well, can Malaysia consider those structures? I don't think we as a society are ready for that. Okay. Because, you know, you go back to attitudes. I, how did they come up with the system in the first place, right? And, and if you look at the genesis of the social welfare state in Europe, it really was um, uh, a result of the Great Depression. Okay. Right. We've never had that kind of catalytic moment. Where well, some would say COVID was one of them. Possibly. Right. Right. But if the politi- but the people are not demanding for it, you know. Because maybe they don't know. They don't. Yeah, exactly. The, the education, you know, they don't understand. They don't have the maturity alternatives. to, no, to lobby for well, that. I won't right? say maturity, but I, I think they've never been educated on the alternatives. So I, I think there was a lot of political will, there was a lot of political support for creating that social welfare state in, in the 1930s. COVID just lasted three years. The Great Depression lasted for almost a decade. And even that, it can be troublesome because, as you said, um, I heard you on, on Ibrahim Sunny, um, in Poland, the health care bill is on an order of magnitude. It's like 1,000% GDP uh, it's over the, the long actual, term. It's actually the pension. The pension, yeah, the, the pension system, right? So just caring for elderly yes. and, and paying for them uh, until they are that's right yeah mortal yeah. so we don't necessarily want that because yeah. and i think society is not ready for that because we don't have that kind of society where um uh we're willing to sacrifice for each other mm. right the, there it's i mean I, I i see some you know um, um beginnings of that you know i think the gita jaga gita was fantastic yeah but yeah. again that was very social and very involuntary well voluntary based. voluntary based yeah. yes do can we do that as a society I'm not sure. And we're consistently? There yet. And I'm consistently. Not sure. We're a multicultural society. Mm. Most of the Europeans are homogeneous. Homogeneous, yeah. yeah. So, you know, will there be ever be political acceptance for that kind of system in Malaysia? I'm not so sure it's mm. there. Uh, we can do s- some elements of it, right? Um, I, think, um, uh, um, I think as the population gets older, there will be more political support for creating a pension type system. Uh, but then it comes back to how, how are we going to finance it, right? Um, there is a possibility of maybe looking at a pillar one rather than a pillar zero. But well, yeah, if I kind of stop you there, right? Paying, paying for something, it's easier when you're making money, right? And as a country, country well, a country's economy is compressed of its people and how well they can produce. Right. If the education sector, is, if your national productivity isn't great, mm-hmm then that's problematic, which then goes back to the other non-retirement issues, which is the yeah. economy and productivity and education and, yeah. and the social. I mean, I heard the World Bank talk about this on, on you know, BFM a few weeks ago. Malaysia has got one of the biggest um, 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 s- s- subsidy systems in the world. Yes. So, so many subsidy systems in the world. Yes. So there's this idea that it's okay to be a little bit mediocre because the state will look after you, right? Mm. It's well, a little bit, and that's that's problematic, I, I because then you don't yeah. work at as high a rate as you can. You don't yeah. skill up as, as as well as you can because you just like have a bit of a lotus eater syndrome, which is problematic as well. I, I think that only is true in spots because um, I, I think the problem with our subsidies is that um, we're not getting any bang for the buck for them, really. <coughs> so um, the biggest one is actually. Fuel, fuel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is totally misdirected on the one hand, uh, very badly targeted on the other. Uh, it's it's not targeted at all right now, right now, is it? Um, I think in the sense of um, uh, you're looking at the target beneficiaries. Who are you actually trying to help? And because it's universal, and because of the nature of petrol, uh, it's actually benefiting higher income households more than it is yeah. lower income households, right? Um, you could try to target it. I think that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> it's going to be troublesome. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just talk about, um, and I know this is going to um, irritate a lot of people, but the easiest comparison is, say, Singapore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Singapore, the height of COVID, they, they basically threw money at, the, at, the, at, at COVID. They didn't have to borrow any money because they had it in their savings, mm-hmm. right? And they spent billions. Mm-hmm. And they had a lot of savings because... They're able to produce at a very high rate. And um, I, I mean, in terms of their GDP, for such a small country, their GDP is slightly higher than Malaysia, which is incredible because mm. it is basically the size of, you know, Butterworth and Penang, yeah. right? 
and for them to produce at such a so their education levels are off the scale, their mm. salaries are off the scale, mm -hmm. they're able to produce at such a high rate, and therefore they can put money aside, and therefore they can pay for these things. Mm -hmm. Malaysia is quite the opposite. We can't afford a lot of things because we just don't have the ability to produce at such a high value. I I I I have a rather jaundiced view of productivity, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, could, we could have a, a, a much longer discussion about that. Yeah, with, uh, yeah. You know, some other day. But, but if we could afford it, we yeah. can pay for it, and yeah. we don't we don't we don't have that ability because we are yeah. just not good enough. Mm. Well, I, I think it depends on what form of savings they have. I mean, the 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 reason I think uh, Singapore has been able to accumulate all those reserves uh, on the government side over the course of these years is it's really a philosophical difference. I think in terms of how to manage the economy, um, I don't necessarily think that having lots of savings is a good on a national level uh, because you're not necessarily utilizing it. Because the the okay, getting a bit technical here, but generally savings is equal to investment, right? And the way Singapore has done it all this while is that those investments happen outside of Singapore, right? So your your savings is actually generating income for somebody else, not for you, right? So I I, I you know there are pros and cons to that kind of approach. So mm. I wouldn't necessarily say it's better or worse than what Malaysia has done. I think the the problem that we had, we could have done the same thing, right? Because in our in Malaysia's case, the savings were private, not public, right? We could have actually utilized private savings to actually do the same thing. In other words, the government could borrow the savings that aren't me actually doing anything, and actually help support the the people during that period of time. But because our laws on government borrowing are so restrictive, um, I, I know we we I think MOF was really struggling to come up with ways to actually finance support for the people during COVID. Yeah, right. yeah. Whereas um, in, in Singapore, it was a lot easier because, you know, we, they, they had a government with a supermajority. Mm. So part of it is political as well. It's very much political. Yeah. So in terms of addressing these, basically, what is essentially very bread and butter issues for yeah. everybody, right? Yeah. Um, with the exception of very few people. W after having studied this area for so many years, um, and there's a lot of resources being poured into it, I mean... Your 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 brain alone is mm -hmm. is a huge contributing factor to this whole area, Hisham. I mean, very few people are as smart as uh, as as you are, and you've been spending a lot of time in this issue. Where's the move? Where's the direction going? Where's the structural reform happening? Um, I don't know. Well, I I think I've been involved in policy making for what, I've got six seven years now, mm. and I think a, a lot of the issues goes back to um, how do you approach problem solving. And are you actually asking the right, because it's very important, are you asking the right questions when we talk about solving problems, right? Are you doing or identifying the correct root cause? Because a lot of the time, what, what I see from our policymakers is that they address symptoms. They don't address the underlying problem or disease. And when you just address symptoms, you're not actually solving the problem, you're just papering it over. Okay, give examples. Um, Affordable housing, very simple, right? Um, you'll notice that regardless of whether it's the opposition or the government, and of course vice versa, um, you know they switch places and everything. The solutions that the government generally comes up with all revolve around financing. And the reason that 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 the reason for that is because the federal government has almost no power over housing. Okay, property is a state matter. Prop property is a? Property, land, is a state matter. Okay. Under the constitution, the states have uh, authority over land, land matters. So um, when you look at why is housing so unaffordable, right? break it down by the cost, and you can look at what the individual cost factors uh, actually contribute to that increase in cost. Right? Yes, building materials have gone up, but then they've come down again. Right. So building materials is, is not really a key issue. It's not about IBS, right? You know, industrial buildings, yeah, buildings and all that, yeah. right? We do have problems in terms of productivity because there's a lot, and that's a totally screwed up area of, of how we manage foreign workers. Uh, I, could, I don't want to yeah, get into again, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long story, yes. uh, another long story. Yes, yes. But uh, fundamentally, it goes back to land costs and land acquisition, right? 
How much the you, you know how much is a parking lot in Singapore in Slango cost? It's roughly about fifty thousand ringgit. It's stupid money. So if you're talking about a double story terrace house, about four hundred thousand, you know, roughly about a twenty five percent of the cost is the two parking lots in front of the house, right? Um, so that gives you an idea just how much uh, the, the the land cost is embedded there, right? Mm. Uh, and I think um, um, and then you go back to why is land so expensive, right? Uh, obviously, one is acquisition. Second is premium conversion. Mm. The conversion premium, sorry. So that's something which the state monetizes. They can uh, easily exactly. reduce that if they want, but they but also need to cash yes, up. Yes, exactly. So yeah. state income, actually 95% of state income actually derives from some form of property tax. Mm. Whether it's conversion premiums, whether it's assessment, whether it's quit rent, 95%. Yeah. If, if people understand the number of layers involved in right. ownership of a property, They'd be scared because you got DBKL, you got Kalian, you got exactly. your borrowing costs, you got inflation, you got yes. oh my god, this is repairs and and the fundamental basis. If the land is expensive, everything on top of it becomes more. Will we'll just be a layer on top of the initial layer, right? Yes, correct. Okay. So when we talk about creating affordable housing, the you know the root cause is that you have to reform state finance. Can that be legislated? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm probably not at a federal level. You have to do it at individual state level. Because oh, the individual state by state. state. Yes. That's going to be like child There's no national land code. I mean, yeah. we, we've got you know, uh, some forms of co uh, you know, cooperation uh, around land matters at the federal level, but fundamentally, property is a state matter. So to me, um, there's all these huge issues which are at play here and which pretty much are Im almost immovable monoliths, right? It then falls upon the individual to say, look, let me as an individual take charge of my own outcomes, right? Yes. Let me take care of my top line, earn more money, yep. and diversify your income sources, mm -hmm. either by entrepreneurship mm -hmm. or by having additional gigs or whatever, yep. right? And, and, and at, a, at a bottom line, right, level, cost yep. management, yep. forego a lot of the frivolities because you can't afford it and yep. shouldn't pay for them, mm -hmm. and then save for the future. If more people can do that, there's less responsibility on the state and people like yourself in EPF to solve their problems for them. Yeah, uh, well, I think that that's twofold. One, you do have to actually earn enough to actually do that. Yeah, right? so, so then again... Yeah, it comes back to the salary issue. Yeah. But then if you do earn enough, then yes, you, you do need to take more responsibility for it. The other thing that's happening as well, which you talked about, is the, the movement away from community-based care at retirement level, mm -hmm. from your sadara sadari, mm -hmm. right, to a more structural thing. So that movement is happening already. It is. How does it look like? Um, okay, the top end, I think we're, we're starting to see a lot of changes. There's retirement villages, you know, old folks' homes. Uh, people, you know, developers are actually starting to look at aged care developments. Okay, there's, yeah. can I just say, in, in Penang, where I come yeah. from, there's two or three developments, right? Yeah. Um, they're quite nascent. Yeah. The one that I saw at Penang Turf Club, they're not bloody cheap, man. The no, cheapest is 8,000 ringgit okay? per month. Yes. Cheapest, okay? Yes. And even that, that is still cheaper than what the models they're following in Australia and, and other places. Correct. So again, if you don't have the financial means, that's yes. out of your reach. Out of reach, yes. And so one year is 96,000. Huh? Yeah. And what happens if, as you say, they live beyond, say, 10 years? Yes. That's a million bucks there, man. Yeah, just you know? like that. Just, just like, like that. that. Yeah. So that's the top end. Mm. Um, I think what um, what we found, because again, working with UM, we've done, we've done a survey, we have a continuous survey every year on, uh, uh, we call it MARS, the Malaysian Aging Research, I don't know, something or other. Mm. Anyway, uh, we follow a particular cohort and then mm. we ask them questions about their, their lives and, and how they're doing mm. and everything. Mm. And I think the, the reality for most people is that they don't want to go to an aged care home. It's a, it's, it's a stigma thing. It's a, it's a well, it's not necessarily it's stigma, a it's, a, it's about independence, you see. I literally went to the one at Penang Club Club right. about three months ago, right? Yeah. It's fantastic. Yes. It looks like the, like the E&O hotel, okay? Yeah. It's fantastic. Your makan is taken care of, you press a bell and a nurse comes running, you've got your own car park, you can come and go yeah. as you please. Yeah. There's a public coach, or well, it's a home coach, which takes you to um, Gurney Plaza, yeah. Georgetown, Batu Fringi, every day, yeah. right? And you can come and go as you please. It's like a condo, yeah. it's like a facility, but you just have the ability to have your meals taken care of. Yeah. Your laundry is paid for you, mm -hmm. right? The cleaning is, is sorted, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's fantastic. I'm going to go there if I can afford it. <laughs> yeah, but I think, again, it goes back to what people actually want, and they're, they're more comfortable aging in place. 
I think about 70, 80% of the Aging in place, uh, in their own home, right? In their own homes, yeah. with their family around them, with their friends around them, with the community around them. You know, mm. you're, you're going to the temple or church or your, your, uh, mosque, you know, yeah. your mosque or surah, you know, every, every week or so. That's the community you want mm. to interact with, not in some condo. Some anodyne place, Where right. you don't know your neighbor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are we going to try to get to know them? Yes, right. And heaven forbid making new friends so at 75. You can never forget that community engagement, that social engagement is very important, uh, you, especially when you get older. Mm. Right? Because mm. that, that actually is one of the things that keeps you going. Yeah. Right? So a lot of people want to do aging in place, but do we have the systems to actually support that? Right? It's starting to come up. And I mean, I, I was at SJMC the other day, um, and they do have... Uh, basically a visiting service so the, the 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 nurse and the doctors will actually go down to uh, to the house and mm. you know and do the checkups and everything uh, then they have a age care i think mm. uh, service as well so it's starting to happen and i think that's a lot more affordable than actually creating a, you know paying for a whole new condo with you mm. know all the facilities and everything Sh should the state step in and build more retirement homes and infant retirement communities I you know, I'm like a desert park city, but for retirement, and you know, some of them, some I, of them are pretty good. I, I know. I, I don't think it's okay because we've seen that in in other places as mm -hmm. well. But again, um, I think that social engagement is important. If you just put a whole bunch of old folks in a old folks area, mm -hmm. then you know you lose a lot of the connection with what's yeah, going on from the home. You. Mm -hmm. you want young people around, right? You want kids who are, you know kids and, and working Running adults. Around, and yeah. You want to have that engagement. Um, so I think it's more about creating a space for the elderly within each community rather than trying to create wholesale retirement villages, right? Um, yes, it's more efficient, you know, because you, you, everybody's one place. You've got mm -hmm. the doctors and nurses mm -hmm. or whatever and, mm -hmm. the, and the carers there. But um, you lose a lot of the value that the elderly can actually bring to a society. So that model, c can it look like, for example, in a neighborhood, right? Yeah. Um, where you you basically got a state-funded um, hub of medical facility where Correct. you've got a general helpline. You just yeah. call up and say, okay, inject this or madam that or whatever. You is. could do that, And yes. within a five-minute driving radius. Yeah. And that's interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then also maybe you've got like a makan, makan like a hub where, yeah. you know, community meals can be, can yes. be prepared yes. and then issued or, or you can come to the canteen as well. Yeah. So that is interesting. That, yes, that, that is, I mean, that's workable. That would be easier yeah. to pull and off. And I think that's it? what Singapore has done with the HDBs. They, okay. they don't create retirement villages or whatever okay. because the elderly are, are part of the community. Already well. in anchored there, right? That's correct. Okay. Right? And they have that, those community spaces for them. And how would the community pay for that then? Higher um, taxes or is it state funded or? You could have a little bit of both, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more... Because that in itself, when we talk, because this is supposed to be a podcast about investment, right? Yeah. That in itself is only an investment opportunity. If you can create services like that, there is a market out there for it. And you could find private sector to pay for it, right? Yes. yes. That would be interesting. Yeah. I, guess that, I think that's one thing that the woman is saying. We think of aging as a problem. Mm. It's also it's an, an opportunity, opportunity as well. Yeah. Right? Uh, and I think EPF is actively looking at it. Uh, Kazana is actively looking at it. We're looking for... Um, Areas that are, these are growth areas for the future. You know, that aged care part, uh, I think facilities for the elderly, uh, medical devices for the elderly, these are all real growth areas mm -hmm. that, you mm -hmm. know, that, that have, you know, you, you could put capital to work there. Yeah, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which I was listening to, you know, uh, earlier, is, is the, the idea of health, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, like, um, too much attention is being placed on healthcare costs mm -hmm. and you know all these instruments that you know basically try and address your health problems mm -hmm. when you're old. Yep. But I don't feel that enough attention is being placed on being healthy when you're younger. Yes. Which is a big problem. Yes. Because we don't have enough facilities yes. for sports or for parks. Yes. We don't have the culture of you know being healthy or yes. being athletic or sporting when we're younger. Because if we were healthier when we're younger then we won't have so many health problems when we're older, Correct. right? Correct. So uh, again, we address the symptoms or the root causes, uh, the, the outcomes. We don't address the root the causes. Cause. Right. That's right. So uh, I, I think I'm, I'm encouraged by what's happening. I think the youth of today are a lot more... Um, health uh, conscious? Yeah, a lot more health conscious. Avocado costs are going through <laughs> the roof, right? Well, that, that's the, the, yeah, the particular yeah. you know, yeah. segment of society. But uh, I think 
running has really taken off. Cycling has really taken fantastic, off. Fantastic, right? fantastic. Um, you know, people are really engaged in, in terms of physical activity. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful that that generational change will eventually, you know, come with lower cost for us yeah. as a society. But that's not to take away from the problems of today. We still have roughly about 17% of the population who are diabetic. We have over a third who are overweight or obese. We talked about the fat tax in Malaysia some years ago, right? I'm and in not fact, sure in Japan, if it's fair, but <laughs> yeah. But I mean, for example, can you legislate the amount of sugar that the mamas put into the teta rate? Because that yeah. is just insane. Yeah, right? can't do that. Can't it, do that. I mean, it goes back to what the individual wants. I mean, and it's personal accountability, right? Correct. You don't want to micromanage to the point that you have yes. to say, "Look, please don't have three teta rates, lah." You know? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> right? Or even one. Yeah. But you know, th it goes into that. And please don't put sugar into your food. Um, which a lot of cooking actually they does. They do? Yes, they do. Well, not quite a lot. Uh, you know, the sambal tumis and all that, right? Um, so it's that consciousness, I think. And, and I think, again, the, the youth of today are a lot more conscious about these things than, than we were in our generation. You know, yeah. we just went, whatever. So we've uh, talked about a lot of things, Hisham. Um, can we summarize, you know, can we try and like TLDR mm -hmm. the discussion we just had in the last 70 minutes, which is basically, what should people do? I think let's let's categorize that. Right? Yeah. What should people do, and what can policymakers consider? I think from um, individual perspective, one is take stock, uh, figure out what your goals are. I think uh, not necessarily just for retirement, but for any financial goal that you might have, whether it's for education, whether it's for you know you want the bucket list travel, mm. uh, but also for that retirement, which is extremely important. You have to set aside something for medical. Uh, trust me, when you hit seven, 70, you need to have your knee replaced, <laughs> or both of them. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, really work towards those goals. Because if you don't set goals, you don't work towards them, right? Uh, and if you do have goals, even if they're, they're really wild eyes in the sky, I mean, I never thought I'd be where I am today when I was younger, mm. right? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you do get, you know, lucky. Um, uh, but... You know, even now, when I'm thinking about retirement, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't have enough. Don't okay. Know. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, then, I, I, I used to ask people this, right? What's your number, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I you know, because I, I think you start realizing just how many things can go wrong. Okay. Let's just do a little segue, right? Yeah. What should be an ideal number? I and don't, yeah, don't, don't be afraid of scaring people. Okay. So, I think, you know, for most people, on the ground, um, you're probably talking about somewhere in the region of between 600 to 1 million ringgit. Most people lah. For most people. I would say that if you're l looking at it from the point of view, I'm living in an urban environment, you know, uh, my kids probably not staying with me uh, or they might move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. if I'm just living on my own with my spouse, somewhere between 600 to 1 million. You can get cheaper if you have you know, you can balik kampung and mm. stay small, small yeah. village, lah. And you have the the community around you that that can help support you. It'll probably be a lot lower, because the the food is not so important, the travel is not so important. You could probably get that those numbers down quite substantially. But if you're living in an urban environment, I think six hundred thousand to one million will be about right. Okay. Yeah. Half a million to one million. Half a million to one million. Okay. One and of course, the to people, you know, take stock, set goals, and be aware yeah. of where you are, right? Yeah. At a policymaker level? I think at a policymaker level, I think first we need to address the gaps. Try to get as many people covered as, as possible because we know adequacy is not, not you know, realistically achievable, right? Uh, we need to also look at what happens when uh, people do fall through the cracks and create that flaw. But essentially, that, that flaw is extremely important. Um, and it's not just at retirement, you're also talking about during your working life. So the elements there, uh, the key risk factors for a lot of people, one is unemployment, second is maternity, and second is child support. Right? So those three elements, if you can take care of that, that covers most of people's needs. And I think that takes a lot of pressure off people. But you, know, you, you have to have that deliberate policy of actually looking at life cycle risk. And what would be a feasible solution for policymakers for just those three key areas, which are not covered right now, right? Yeah. Unemployment, maternity, and childcare support. Okay, so unemployment, I think, I th well, I've had some discussions with Soxo about, you know, w whether it's feasible to extend EIS to, 
the informal sector. Employment insurance, yes. yes. That's one possibility. Um, I think for maternity, obviously that's something that, that's not covered at the moment. Uh, anything that we do there will be fantastic. Uh, I think child support, some of it is actually covered under the... What do they call it now? Sumbangan Tunai Rahma. So now it's, it's family-based. Yeah. So you get more if you have more children. But I think if you can strengthen that, for example, if we repurpose uh, the fuel subsidies into more support in cash. That's, that's quite a few billion there, actually. Yes, um, mm. about 20-odd billion, I think, at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Stop getting those people who own Bentleys filling with Ron 95. That's unfair, man. Yes, exactly. And stop those Singaporeans from filling up in their Porsche Cayennes with Ron 95 <laughs> as well. Yes, yes. That's unfair, too. Yes. Yeah. Because, uh, well, fundamentally, uh, you don't need anything higher than Ron 95 anyway. No, so, no. Yeah. You know, having Ron 97 is... I think one idea I think a friend of mine actually proposed was let's introduce Ron 92. You know, Thailand is Ron 92. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. You get a bit juddery sometimes, <laughs> but it's yeah. jalan, la, you know. Jalan, yeah. most, of our, most of our cars actually. My Kapcha is fine with yeah. 92, yeah. yeah exactly. In fact, I think um, when I was in Laos, they were running 85, 84, and that's okay too. Yeah, of course. But yeah. everybody with a two litre car, they're not going to go with 92. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that that's you know one one way of doing it, uh, but fundamentally I think um, um, the fuel subsidies definitely have to go. We have issues with climate change already, right? And that's just going to get worse. Um, but repurpose that into meaningful support for people, uh, and in a way that actually covers their key issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. one more issue before we stop. Okay, um, I'd like to ask your opinion on rethinking the idea of retirement mm -hmm. because a lot of people believe that once you hit 55 or even 50 if you're lucky you stop working and then you live on your retirement savings mm -hmm. should the idea of retirement be rejigged to include the idea that you continue to work you don't actually retire in a conventional traditional sense you continue to work in any number of ways right yeah. as a consultant as a grab driver mm -hmm. finding new skills and yep. monetizing that so then the burden on Although all those other things are minimized yep. and you still have an inflow of income. Yep. Uh, I, okay. One is that Malaysia has one of the lowest retirement ages in the world. Right? Everybody else has moved up. But that's also unfair. Why would you want people to work at 62, 65? That's, that's almost an inhuman lie, you know? No, it's not. Because I think um, what, what happens is that um, as life expectancy has increased, so has active life expectancy. Yeah, but you want to work on your own terms, in your own yeah. time, doing things that you love, rather right. than continuing in your inane corporate job. So what's happened in Singapore is that they have a re-employment law. Right? So you can, um, uh, what companies are required to do is once you hit the retirement age, you're required to offer that employee an extra five years of employment, but at a reduced rate and for a uh, reduced time. Okay. So you don't, you're not no longer coming in five days a week, right? You are still employed, you're still doing work, but it's on like a short scale kind of basis. So it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So something like that can be, can be and I think so the take up is something like 97, 98%. Most people take it. Um, and, uh, but I think from the reality for most people is that whether they're given a choice or not, uh, sorry, uh, they basically still have to continue to work because they simply don't have enough money. Um, and how do we facilitate that? Right? You could extend the retirement age, right? because that will give you, one, it increases your, um, the, the amount you accumulate while shortening the amount that you need to decumulate. Mm -hmm. right? um, and second, of course, it keeps you active. And I think keeping active is actually quite important, I think, in terms of you know, keeping healthy and you know, being engaged. And, well, you know, Lee Kuan Yew famously said that once you stop working, you start to die, right? And even Tun Mahathir till today is working. He's working and sucks off. That yes. could be why he's uh, still alive at 96. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because the brain, the brain is still, is still working. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, I think one is raising the retirement age is something that we can't discount, right? Uh, but second, also we need to provide support for elderly work, right? Um, to ensure that people have those options for employment after the official employment, uh, uh, sorry, retirement. Um, and I think that's, um, that's one way we can address some of these issues around uh, inadequacy of savings. All right, man, that was fantastic. I get the feeling that we're going to be discussing this 
on a number of levels yes. in the years to come because yes. it's, it's by no means fully addressed. Of course, and I think this is something that's um, um, we're not quite out of time yet, but you know we're getting there. Okay, man. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure.